Mic check. One. Goodness. Okay. How's this, everybody? Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Sounds good. I will do my announcements now, because you're eager to go, and my announcements are I hope everybody's having a good time so far. Yes? Nice, wonderful. Good, good, good. A um, few couple of things, you know, keep your masks on, unless you're eating and drinking, please hydrate yourself. We want to make sure everybody's good this weekend. You know, if you need a mask break, go outside, take a break. We encourage that. We still have um, a fourth, we have a fourth track for like, talks that some of you are probably facilitating just on the go. You could go to the coffee shop to look those up or go on our wiki page and check those out. Um, we still have, is it Hackers Got Talent tonight? I think so. If you want to a karaoke, one of those, sign up. Karaoke. Oh, so we, I think you guys are singing, huh? Okay, so we'll see you there. Um, please sign up for those and have a good time. Um, and then we have a matrix chat and some questions are coming in from there. People are really engaging in the online versions. The cool thing about that is that's going to be ongoing. And so we might even post this talk there. So if you want to continue the conversation, please go there. And that's going to be ongoing. So without further ado, this is Let's Talk About Buy Printing with Xavier Lewis Palmer. Give him a round of applause and let's get started. Hello, everybody. All right. Uh, my name is, oh, yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, for an introduction, uh, oh, here we go. All right. So for an introduction, I have lived most of my life thus far on the East Coast. Uh, I'm a student, tech enthusiast, and enjoy collaborating on cool biomedical projects. I did reading, taking part tech. My first was NES, and uh, yeah, uh, I love art. Uh, to the right, you'll see images of me working on my lab's bioprinter in 2018. Uh, courtesy, and this image is courtesy of the Daily Press and Virginia Pilot. Uh, uh, next is a snapshot of one of our papers, followed by figures of a chimeric memory organoid developed uh, with the use of our 3D uh, bioprinter. My dissertation work was in part built around these things. I was introduced uh, to Hope in 2016 as a participant and was taken aback at the warmth of the community. Uh, activities prepared, frankness of conversation, freedom of uh, exploration, and more. To be here as a speaker is surreal and an absolute pleasure. Um, in general, I spent a lot of time in school. Prior to my doctorate work, had two bachelor's degrees from ODU, uh, one in philosophy, uh, one in biological sciences, from East Virginia Medical School, same city, acquired a master's in biotechnology, and then tackled the other master's in cyber in the middle of my engineering PhD, while my lab temporarily closed uh, during the pandemic. Previous research experience before grad school uh, brought me to the National Institutes of Standard Technology and the American Dental Association uh, Foundation and several university labs. Let's continue. All right, so this talk will be mostly introductory and casual. I decided to cut out a lot of material and jargon as well as simplify quite a bit for time and focus. This will also be fast to make the fit. <laughs> we'll discuss bioprinting and bioprinting culture along with some resource and place to look. Expect some overly but genuinely sentimental <laughs> shout outs after. Further, I am excluding crucial commentary on my dissertation work and out of respect of my lab, additional time will be given as a bon uh, for a bonus uh, feature and to also field questions as I want this to be more interactive versus just me lecturing. But that'll be, again, towards the end. Let's proceed. So what is bioprinting? It's essentially a transport of biological materials onto a surface or into an object with the goal of building. The media, that is the material in which biological material is suspended, uh, plus biological materials of interest, are together referred to as bio ink, of which there are many types. Bioprinters can be 2D, that is, they can print on many surfaces, or 3D, that they can print along a third axis. The most functional will be of the latter. Uh, com um, commonly, you'll find that many uh, printers use syringes to deposit biological material, but that's not the only means. The bio ink is often comprised of media made from the 
from other living cells that assist them with the process of adhesion, proliferation, and differentiation during and after the printing, well, or after the printing. For those not developing tissue systems, the bio ink may s simply be composed of what can preserves the biological materials or facilitates their transport through whatever, uh, whatever containers uh, that they pass through. For example, if you're printing something that clogs needles uh, or activates uh, like or activates prematurely, your ink might have compounds that resist that. On the bioactive side, your bio ink might be configured to maintain conditions that will prevent the degradation of proteins or other bioactive molecules, or even add structure to your construct later on. Common bio inks are adapted from natural polymers and biomaterials found in extracellular matrices such as gelatin, chitosan, various types of alginates, collagen, and more. Some are synthetic. Further, the format of bio uh, 3D bio print. Uh, the format of 3D bioprinter prints is a variable. Some 3D bioprinters work with large cells or large aggregates of cells or otherwise uh, large aggregates of uh, materials, while some aim for smaller aggregates or even on the single cell basis. Uh, printing in large cell aggregates or biomaterial aggregates allows for the ease of printing and large scale construct development, but cell count precision and microstructure desired may be sacrificed in the process. A lot of uh, prints are just blobs sometimes, but hey, it can be useful. But to the right, you'll see, uh, strateg you'll see strategies for bioprinting, as shown in Heinrich et al.'s 2019 paper, 3D bioprinting uh, from benches to, traditional, uh, tra to translational applications. These are but some of many types of uh, strategies that exist. You have sterilith sterilithography, ink to jet printing, laser assisted bioprinting, extrusion bioprinting, and electrospinning uh, based bioprinting. But again, these are just some. We can usually take an entire day running through how all of these work specifically, but we don't. We won't use them for the. Uh, so we won't mention these for the, uh, for the for the for the for the purpose of time. We won't go into detail for the purpose of time. Later, I will go into de uh, to, into depth uh, for one of these, uh, which is extrusion, but that'll be later. The workflow of bioprinting is fairly simple once your project is planned out. Uh, from there, one creates the design they want, selects the bio inks and apparatuses to use, pr they print the construct, and process the printed construct after. A figure from the paper Bioprinting for the Biologist by Deli et al. in 2021 is shown on the upper left. Uh, the up overall paper is good and accessible to read. I recommend reading through it. Uh, therein, they detail the process well from a biologist from biologist's perspective. An engineer or artist may provide tweaks, but is uh, a sol it's a solid workflow uh, overall. 3D scanning can play a role in the crafting of more true to form body features as mentioned in the work of Sale et al 2014, this paper, which is bioprinting technologies applications. And one section they describe medical imaging used towards crafting a more biomimetic structure modeled after a body part. A workflow figure taken from the, uh, from the paper is shown in the lower left. Here we go. Oh, something's missing. Okay. Yeah, so bioprinters are used in a variety of ways by many labs, be they industrial, academic, government labs, community biospaces, or the home lab of Tinkerer. For example, on the industrial side, com companies like Organova or Rokit have printers in which uh, they, you know, they, uh, they have printers of which they print cells or scaffolding materials together on a macro scale in large, uh, reliable shapes. At the high end, printers like these can cost from the tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars, but are thus out the rate and are thus out the range of many, uh, many, uh, many DIY enthusiasts. Um, in response, many uh, teams have uh, fashioned reliable bioprinters uh, that are uh, that are quite affordable, some as low as 250 euros. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the quality is necessarily up to par, but they do allow for some reasonable insights. While the making and use of bioprinters are important, the benefits of the use are also worth discussing. Bioprinting allows for a wide range of novel basic science experiments. The processes bring closer the possibility of organ tissue replacements in the not so far future. This is increasingly important as citizens all over the world continue to face organ do uh, donor so uh, shortages and many uh, donated organs remain incompatible with potential uh, uh, recipients. Are, the possibilities are many, if not endless, but much work is required to unlock this potential. The top image shows the picture of a bi 3D bioprinter produced using a RepRap 3D printer, which can be affordably acquired. The lower left and right image shows off the commercial Rokit Dr. In Vivo 46 and the Organovo Novogen NMX printers, which uh, can print high quality. Uh, each of these, DIY and commercial, each have value in the same world despite their differences. So for the enthusiast, uh, bioprinting allows for multiple prom 
promising avenues. Some of these options exist uh, in, but are not exclusive to the avenues of prototyping platforms, structurally or behaviorally. Um, these also include art, basic science, engineering, re um, basic science engineering research, and wearable and implant testing. Uh, basic science and engineering come easiest to mind, particularly through the focus of the benefits in superior 3D culture. And 3D culture produces 3D bioprinting. Uh, of course, through uh, versus traditional uh, 2D and 3D culture, you get increased organization of biomaterials and cells. For some work, this can mean more subtle cell interactions. This can mean uh, 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 Im <coughs> improved culture, uh, culture integrity through more pronounced ECM uh, deployment. And by ECM deployment, I mean, I mean as the extracellular matrix, which are these network proteins that cells extrude. Um, this, this can also mean stronger in vitro microenvironment microenvironmental modeling. Thanks, SARS guys. <laughs> Whew. Uh, greater tissue complexity, and above all, more automatable and repeatable interactions. Through the process, uh, you can design helpful experiments that allow people deeper insight into how cells interact, how biological or biologically based structures will behave under numer numerous internal or external stressors, and more. Basic answers to basic questions form the foundation for more complex work and are not to be underestimated or looked down upon. These are easily in the range of amateur and otherwise early scientists. These scientists with basic but sufficiently calibrated tools and well reined in hypotheses can do a lot to advance modern science through experiments that amplify precision in examining key molecular signals that take place between cells, their environment, and or examine the structural and chemical components of various microenvironments generated. And just for and for review, like microenvironments is the environment like that are immediately that's immediately around the cells. Um, an engineer can add value in research, for example, by uh, finding more efficient ways to precisely place materials within 3D culturing systems uh, or make 3D printers more cost-effective. As, as a prototyping platform, gleaned from uh, set was said above, improved biotextiles or similar products can be better made and trialed. An easy example of this thing comes in the form of food or clothing, or clothing material. With the right bioprint design, you can create and uh, test rapidly. Art. Uh, speci specifically, bioart is an exciting uh, venue as well. Bioinks, again, the material used to print, allow artists additional means to explore visual and or uh, tactile concepts uh, in that, are, that are quite dynamic. Um, for example, um, those working with molds, bacteria, and yeast can have them uh, plotted through agarose or similar jello-like material for a 4D work of art. Additives to your jello can enhance your display through time time delay, color changes, opacity changes, texture changes, or otherwise. You do not have to, you not only have to print in gels, you can print on papers, films, and other types of surfaces that suit your fancy. Uh, bioprinting can be a fine way to make your art precisely come alive. Finally, for those testing wearables, implants, and various other active compound, compounds that interact with the body, bioprinting gives an avenue by which one can test their effects on specific animal tissues without harming a whole complex organism. Of course, there are caveats. This is already done with various drugs cosmetics. No matter who you may be, bioprinting has appeal for everyone. All right, so from my use, uh, largely via my dissertation-based work, I went with ex the extrusion uh, variety, specifically mechanical. Um, this figure um, on the, this figure on the, uh, uh, on the right shows uh, two, and I used the one on the left, which was the, which is a uh, schematic for the uh, me mechanical microextrusion. Tong et al. Uh, 2021 gives a nice breakdown on the generalities of mechanical extrusion, as shown on the left from the figure above. To quote, the plunger then generates a compression force on the piston of a syringe, which contains a bio ink. The rotation of the stepper motor defines the speed and quantity of the extrusion thereby allowing the printing process to be controlled by a computer program. Meanwhile, the gauge of the syringe's needle acts as a nozzle and defines the diameter of the extruded filament. It is also noteworthy to mention that there is a variant of mechanical extrusion that uses a turning screw, which is not shown in this example, uh, like what is used in industrial screw-driven polymer extruders to push the bot ink out of the nozzle. However, this method is less popular because it can inter introduce unjustified damage to the cells inside of bio ink, end quote. However, I could say that the last part can and was engineered around. So our lab uh, pioneered a low-cost extrusion-based 3D bioprinter that allows us to deposit cells directly into a pre-prepared Exceller matrix rather than print cells with ECM. You can move differently than, uh, than how else is in research with enough, uh, with enough, with enough, with enough research inside and effort. Our 3D uh, bioprint has a, f 
is a Felix 3.0 bioprinter that is, uh, oh, so it's, a it's a Felix 3.0 3D printer that's been modified through the addition of components and other accessories listed at odustemcell.org. That is, you can download our plans and apply it to your own printer. This bioprinter prints a bioink composed of cells and base media. Uh, these are pushed through a specially fashioned micropipette through a pre-prepared exceller matrix in the form of a hydrogel within the wells of a cell plate. Pr uh, print patterns in terms of the print array shape, the cells per injection, Injection more made into the uh, Excel matrix are determined through G code, which are generated through a MATLAB script and fed to a printer controller. Successful 3D prints are placed to an incubator at 37 degrees Celsius and culture over one to two week periods, examined optically through fluorescence microscopy. The uh, last, the picture, top left uh, picture shows an early version of our custom extruder head uh, from a 2016 paper. The top right shows a print path for extruder as dictated uh, via G, G code, generated for, uh, from a MATLAB script. Our, the lower left image shows a 48 well uh, plate uh, with us uh, eight separate prints. The picture is courtesy of the Virginia Pilot and Daily Press who came through to learn more about our lab's work. The lower right is a chimeric uh, organoid that's uh, developing from one of our prior papers at different time points. As you can see, the living components, oops, as you can see, the living components make 3D uh, prints rather dynamic. One of the main motivations behind this design route is that it is highly accessible, allowing for highly repeatable results. All these aspects are needed in biomedical science. With such a platform, you can create your code, print your cells, develop your organoids and uh, tissue structures, and then share your code and results with interested scientists. This can be made for less than $1,500. Of course, we are not the only lab um, with you know, with, uh, with affordability in mind, but it's neat to share. Uh, some labs have used even cheaper 3D printers to, to make bioprinting more accessible in different capacities. So uh, projects, as you will find, are not always straightforward. In bioprinting, you have a lot to consider. It is helpful to ask yourself which one to design, when and how you process it, and the parameters required for your incubating system to keep each comp component functional. It helps to have a reference for all of these, especially the latter. I recommend looking up rec recent research on what other groups are doing, along with finding the rationale. You will find a variety of information with uh, varying efficacy, but it's all useful if you know how to analyze it all. Learning from the successes of teams and the missteps is exceedingly valuable. For significance into understanding prior research into environmental components of your design, I'll take a page from developmental biology as applied to tissue engineering. For those uh, new to developmental biology, cell fate determination refers to how a cell develops into a particular cell type. Various aspects of cell fate can be determined not just by cell genomics, but also by their microenvironment. The cellular microenvironment comprises everything that surrounds cells from their extracellular fluid, their secreted proteins, nucleic acid, their neighbors, signaling molecules present in their environment, and structures that they are attached to or otherwise interact with. It's not a, this is not exclusive. The, the figure to the right from Huang et al. 2017 shows, some, shows the various components wi within 3D culture that researchers are mindful of. If your project concerns tissue engineering, for example, you find that your research will require moderation to avoid going over budget. Many of you who are trying to grow a new appendage might have to wait uh, some good time. Tissue engineering holds promise not just for re regenerative technologies, but also for basic and translational science, scientific study of stem cell and cancer biology. However, many essential developmental techniques that would lead successfully to these advances require much validation. To close this gap, numerous incremental steps are needed. These require an integrated understanding of genomic cell behavior, physical signals in the immediate environment, and improve framework for understanding how these altogether impact cell fate. Additionally, better tools to reconstruct these environments to validate, to validate the uh, improved cell uh, frameworks are also needed. Now, it's not to say that you can't create cool stuff. But I trust that many of you will be part of why and when we can create even cooler stuff. It just requires extra nuance. So, stuff that, uh, the part that many of you have been waiting for, some DIYs, uh, resources. Oh, it's a typo, oh, let's see, uh, yes. So, th that said, uh, 3D bioprinting is highly accessible. You can start by choosing a 3D bioprinting kit and modify it to your specifications to print as per your strategy. You may find that electrospinning may suit you better than stereolithography. I recommend kits as they simplify the building and printer prototyping process. You may find that electrospinning may suit you better than stereolithography or some other process. I recommend, like, <coughs> sorry. Further, um, several kits are open source, allowing you greater flexibility in design. Open source has that benefit, and you can modify a, you can choose the option of modifying a pre-prepared printer, but you stand to face more challenges in deconstructing uh, uh, proprietary hardware and software if it is not open source. The worth of either path is up to you and your project. A team um, 
at Frederick Alexander University, Erlingen, Nuremberg, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. They modified an ANET A8, for example, and document their success in their journal article, producing some, some helpful work. Their printer cost them 150 euros. An, a an ANET A8 was also used by a team uh, from the University of Patras in, Gr in Greece. For those that are not ambitious, and, not as ambitious, but, can, but and would like some assistance, some groups have created their own that you can use for inspiration, and they and they even they pl place those instructions on instructables. Uh, for example, a team at UC Davis modified a monoprice uh, printer and posted their designs via instructables to create a bioprinter. Their printer can be designed for less than four hundred dollars. Um, BioCares, a, a, bio a community biospace in California, produced a guide for an even cheaper printer for $150. Their instructions are very accessible as well. Uh, the question that remains is of how much effort you wish to apply as far as uh, building your, where you want to go with your, it, it depends on where you want to go with your printer and how much effort you want to supply towards it. But nonetheless, with bio, the fun is more inclined towards the biological aspects of your project. If you have the donor capacity, it's fine to defer the engineering of the hardware involved to teams who sunk a lot into R&D already. Thus, a commercial route can suit you. All 3DP uh, lists several commercial bioprinters out there. For those with the dough, but not too much, uh, the previous mentioned paper by Tong et al. Uh, in 2021 gives a review of low-cost 3D bioprinters out there. So as you work your way into bioprinting, it's tempting to build and just do stuff without much groundwork. That's totally understandable, but if you want to take your projects further, you will eventually want to read the works of people who have worked in your area before and have uh, documented it. To paraphrase a mentor of mine, an hour in the library can be a day in the lab. That's not to say that you should take literature at face value or that you shouldn't spend re resources replicating. You're encouraged to be skeptical. However, you will find that you will find several insights that that you will find several insights that may have been repeated enough that you can temporarily skip some steps in the piloting of your process. You're encouraged to hop on Google Scholar or whichever research-based search engine you prefer and see where your subfield is. To take a step further, you're encouraged to reach out and collaborate with others. Speaking with experience, uh, many ex ex researchers are happy to share insights and resources, including their papers, and the off chance your interlibrary loan or hub does not have that paper. Citations and other mentions of interest in work can be like crack to researchers. No matter how much, <laughs> no matter how you get into it, if you are interested, get in the game, show the world what you're made of and what you've made. So I have a lot of people to shout out, but I want to leave it here for several reasons. Uh, the first shout out goes to Rhett Sanders, may he rest in peace. He's a scientist with a kind soul who cheered me in chem, the alternative uh, bio scene in Norfolk, Virginia, and introduced me to my friend Jameson Duncan. The Norfolk arts and bio scene is a better place because of his presence. Regarding Jameson Duncan, many of you have been here since 2016. Uh, know Jameson for his talk at, at the 11th Hope in 2016 titled Biology for Hackers and Hackers for Biology. Many of you have all seen his talk at Hope, creating a general purpose network through wireless mesh. Great talks. Jameson introduced me to Hope at a time that I was lacking in a lot, and it's cool to accompany once, once again. Among many things, he has my thanks for good times and introduced me to this incredible community. In talking with him, you'll quickly, you'll quickly get that he wants a better world for us all. That's dope. And uh, together, Jameson and uh, Rhett formed a community biospace called Biologic, in which gave folks an alternate space to learn uh, intro bioconcepts. We would teach groups of all ages cool bioconcepts, and we earned a moniker, the crazy hair crew, <laughs> teaching beside him, and, and Rhett has been a joy. Another person I want to shout out is uh, Sebastian Koshoba of New York Botanics and Bionomica Labs. He has learned an intense number of techniques and in information surrounding plant genetics, programming, hardware design, and teaches it to good souls. You've likely read about the Atlantic, Wall Street Journal, Genetic Literacy Project, uh, and more. And I can tell you, he's even more amazing than these articles show. He's one of many who have met and have been inspired by it at Hope back in 2016. He, he contributes to a lot of scientific causes that promote literacy and reasonable access. I ask that you donate to his causes so that he can help his work and those trusted to boost educational uh, efforts and initiatives. Next, the Globe Community Bio Summit. Uh, gets in the shadow as well. It is a wonderful community composed of individuals across the globe who are interested in bio art, bio design, science communication, uh, biosecurity, food, and more. There are a ton of people within I would like to thank, but that's a, that's, that's a lot, so I'll leave it as a group a mention. They are having a hybrid uh, conference this November from the 18th to the 20th if you're interested in community bio and want to learn more about the various projects that individuals from around the world bring to the table. Uh, for that, uh, visit biosummit.org. Next. I want to thank everyone whose research supports helped me along in my grad school career, general research, and this talk. We stand on the shoulders of giants, and I welcome you all in research and, and just general DIY hobbying to stand on mine. 
Um, next to last, I want to thank everyone Hope Community. It's been a joy to be amongst you once again as a participant and a speaker. Um, I also thank you for you all for your patience <laughs> throughout this. Um, last, I want to thank the tinkerer who is not sure if he belongs. It is very awkward and has to be watching this and listening to his talk. I want to tell you that you, mostly cer you most certainly do matter, and I and so many others are glad that you're here. Furthermore, we're waiting for your next talk. So, for, for references, I listed uh, several uh, review papers. When jumping in the field, review papers are an excellent way to um, to understand a field very quickly, as will give you a wide view of the field and can quickly bring you up to speed. For anyone wanting to dip to dip to gaps left open from this talk, I encourage jumping into the into these and reading to your heart's content. I occasionally get asked uh, where to start in bioprinting, but frankly, it's best to get in where you can and learn, just like any other area you're interested in. There's no correct entry point, just easier ones. However, you won't get anywhere if you don't start at all. You can see all that could have been said, and I hope and you'll and you'll see. Which you, and I hope that you see what you uh, what you want to learn more of, and and I hope that you ask these in the uh, upcoming questions, and I hope that you that you enjoy the ride as you pursue bioprinting, if that's your fancy. Also, I'm listing the work of people from my uh, from my lab at ODU in the in the section below. In order, the first paper descri describes the adaption of a low cost 3D printer for a precise cell placement, along with its characterization. There, and you'll find the aforementioned link to how to print the parts to make it an accessory for converting a 3D. Uh, printer into a bioprinter, along with useful characterization. Oh, yeah, along with uh, additional info. The next is a paper that uh, discusses the consistent and reproducible 3D culturing of memory epithelial structures uh, using our bioprinting platform. That is, after all, that is a paper that uh, describes print as. Oh, oh, sorry, I misread. After that is a uh, paper that describes the printer as a platform for making tumoroids and chimeric memory organoids that can be mechanically analyzed. Um, the paper after describes the culture of 3D uh, bioprint organoids in human-derived and other XL matrices. I also have some publications in the works that describe some of my PhD work, but that'll go on set for now to respect for my team. All these works are important as example of reproducible science and as a basis, and as a basis for, and as a basis uh, for these works lie in a 3D printer that can be programmed to print more precisely, and a team willing to see it through. So once again, I thank you all. If you have any questions, please forward them to x bio xpolymer at protonmail.com. And um, there's one more thing. Uh, a lot of y'all present might say, well, this talk is well uh, is well and neat, but I don't have a space to, to do any of this work or any material training, etc." Don't worry, we have you. Uh, for those looking for a space to do perform bioprinting or any uh, related bio work, there are places to consider domestically and internationally. Above is a non-exhaustive list of groups to, oh, Sorry. Whew. Yeah. Above is a non-exhaustive list of groups to check out. Not everyone listed has uh, dedicated spe specifically, spe specially, or specific. Well, not everyone has specifically dedicated teams for bioprinting, but they are a community biospace where you can meet cool people who may, and eventually form a working group. Startups often come from these spaces as well. So if you're particularly innovative and hungry, there might be spots for you to reach out to. In New York City, there's Bionomic Labs, Biotech Without Borders, and GenSpace. Elsewhere in, in, in the USA, there's BioBlaze, BioCurious, Counterculture Labs, Baltimore, undergra Underground Science Space, Boss Lab, and more. You can find even more of these at biosummit.org. The contact information for Biotech Without Borders listed to the right. Please know that their, oh, yes. Please know that their lab is, uh, is open and looking for folks to use it. I mean, I mean for, to use it for tinkering, as well as uh, sh sharing the care of the common infrastructure. Please contact Danny Chan. He's delightful to talk with. In fact, you can hear from right now uh, on the options that exist. Danny, will you please come to the stage? Uh, all right. Uh, thank you. Oh, thanks, Xavier. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of nice. Uh, this is my first hope, and uh, Xavier and I met at BioSummit. Um, or uh, maybe Biosummit, certainly online. I'm not sure if we met in person in 2019. But um, yeah, uh, I helped steward the lab uh, Biotech Without Borders. And so uh, ooh, I just wanted to uh, share some slides with you just to talk about community biology and the lab that we have in New York City in the hopes that it might be useful for you to find either your own spaces in your own respective localities or check us out um, uh, at some point in the future. So, you know, um, community biolabs, often also called DIY biolabs, biohack spaces, biomaker spaces. Um, 
just a bunch of equipment that's brought together specifically for molecular biology is typically the thing that people are looking for. Um, they're outside of academia and industry, um, but because the equipment is interesting to scientists, then you often get a bunch of scientists coming through the space because they're curious um, on how people are using it outside of the spaces they're comfortable in. Um, it's a really cool opportunity to do science in a sort of slightly different way. Um, I wanted to share with you this timeline that I put together about DIY biology because I think it's interesting um, context that you know labs have always existed inside of our homes. Um, tinker tinkerers and artists like uh, like look to new technologies to try to play around with them. Dr. Steve Kurtz is like a well-known example um, because uh, they were ma they were making some art in their in their home, uh, specifically trying to call out sort of some influence of the pharmaceutical industry in our health in our healthcare life. Um, and the FBI took action against them. They were acquitted of all the charges, um, but that sort of put this like chill over the community in terms of like, should we have labs in our homes? Um, I think you, you should. But uh, the FBI then reached out um, into the community to try to, uh, I guess, make sure they had some level of control. But actually from that meeting, it brought together a lot of different people that were just like, we should do this. And, and it really more widely popularized those ideas. So in 2011, there's this website, DIYBio.org. It's still available. Um, the sphere.diybio.org has a nice map. Uh, it's a little bit out of date. Um, but yeah, they, they inadvertently brought the community together, uh, started a, a whole bunch of different projects. Open Insulin is a project you might have heard of that's come out of this community, out of counterculture labs. Um, of course, companies want to uh, make money out of uh, DIY biology or biology in general. Venture capital funds have like emerged to try to you know make use of that. There are still self-organized uh, bio biology conferences. Bio Summit, I think, is a good example of one. Um, and there's also this program, Just One Giant Lab, where you can get micro grants to do small projects. And that that was incredibly successful over the pandemic time. So Biotech Without Borders, we're a nonprofit based in NYC. We have this mission, sort of vaguely, but uh, you can read about us more on our website. Um, the whole idea is that you know it's hard to maintain certain pieces of equipment in your own home. And so this is a nice common place that you can come. So if members can um, justify the purchase of a piece of equipment or like something building out something in our space um, uh, against our mission, vision, and values, then you're welcome to propose that to the group and we can try to get it done. Um, so yeah, so you, if you need to find me, uh, those are some of my contact information. Um, I'm also in the, the matrix chat. And uh, again, thank you, Xavier, for giving me a chance to speak. And uh, you should come back up and we should answer questions together, I think. Awesome. We have about 20 minutes for questions, and we have one in the Matrix chat. Um, but you go ahead. Yes. Oh, yes. So, so essentially, use uh, 2D culture to, uh, to form the cells needed. But uh, as long as the, but uh, uh, with this, uh, well, I'm speaking in the context of how I've done my lab. Uh, we'll have like a base media that's uh, already prepared as in, you know, there's no FBS, no other like uh, active uh, molecules that would cause these cells to try to like grow together or try to uh, connect prematurely. Um, you would then, um, you would then uh, get those, you would then mix those together and you would uh, pl place those in your needle and uh, Place that into the bio printer, and uh, print away after your uh, after the rest of your setup's uh, done, including your coding. But well, far, I'm sorry, I'm I'm, exp I'm describing the entire process. But yeah, just mixing the uh, cells that you farmed and uh, with the uh, base media, and uh, you uh, continue from there. Yes. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Well, I mean, think of. Uh, Think of, uh, I would say, what's a uh, what is the food that you would that you, what are foods that you like? Well, I mean, you know, yeah, some examples you want to give. I'll say so. Okay, so when you're uh, Bioprinting, uh, the question, well, 
actually, let me roll back a bit. Um, it really depends on exactly what you want to create. If you're trying to, let's say, create a like food in a particular pattern, let's say you want to, I don't know, take, uh, you know, uh, cells from you know, like your favorite animal, or but uh, or uh, better yet, let's say you want to take uh, various plant uh, plant cells, you want to put it in a new form, a new shape. You can do that with bioprinting itself. Um, you can, uh, but of course, someone just say that's you know food plotting, but I'm leaving options open for people to, you know, be more exploratory with uh, their food choices. I know, I understand there's like a lot of uh, traditions where people like their food raw, and essentially, you could, well, I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it depends on your creativity. Yes? Along the same lines, has anyone done anything with brewer's yeast to add something that slowly becomes more alcoholic? Like, because if you place the yeast strategically above sugars, you could actually do something like that. Oh, this is, uh, yeah, it's going to go out of uh, bioprotein. I don't know if uh, anyone has uh, made anything that's like more alcoholic, but I do know several who have, uh, you know, made a beer that glows green or other colors, which is, you know, used for St. Patty's Day, which is pretty cool. Any additional questions? Yeah, we have one from The One Wolf, who wants to ask a two part question. Um, the low cost buy printer, you said, did you say it was like $1,500 or like what's the price for a starter? There's some even cheaper, I'd say. Are you talking about the commercial ones or is he talking about commercial just, oh, okay. And um, he also wants to know what would, or they want to know what would be a first project in bioprinting? Like what would be a good starter project? All right, a good starter project is one that uh, BioCare State where they were just uh, they were just printing like their name or words sequences and uh, you know it, with with E. coli that were uh, that were made to uh, glow green. They um, that's that would be that would be a nice starter. Um, just just printing just the shapes to get to get your uh, just get your uh, get a handle on it and so. But then over time, uh, I guess uh, if someone wants to build, you can look at creating uh, you know like more complex tissues. But yeah, starting out with just uh, simple like shapes, patterns, that's a fine one. Is there a, was there not another component to that question? I, nope, that was it. All right, uh, yes. Now that one, so my answer to that can be quite divisive because I won't answer that directly, but I will say that there are a lot of structures out there that well, they have the shape of the organ, they or the or whatever they're trying to make, but it is it's not really that functional. And if you uh, zoom in, some parts are not that biomimetic. Um, and I think that's important why we focus on the. I think that's that that draws importance to why we focus on you know getting these smaller details right, understanding all these like cell cell interactions and so. And also, it's why it's important that for a lot of printers, if you're trying to look, if you're trying to generate some features, yeah, you want to make sure you, you want to make sure that you're getting it from the bottom up. Otherwise, it, it's hard to, it's hard to, it's hard for me to get, well, for a lot of examples I'm thinking about, it's hard for me to say that I actually would say that it's, uh, it merits, well, there's a lot of ways I can go with this, and all right, but I'll say that, um, when you say the most complex tissue, as in a functional one. Yeah, a uh, yeah. functional, because in a certain muscle cell, it could be a visual versus non-visual. Correct. It could be changing the capillary system for delivering oxygen and these nutrients, but the immune nerve cells are just screwed. Mm -hmm. Indeed, I would say that, uh, I would say the complex, uh, I say the complex organs that we, or, that we would find impressive, those are still some time away. I'm also trying to avoid. Uh, Don't avoid, go speak. for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think about it, but yes. Print a what? A tattoo. A tattoo? What's that too? Yeah. Like if you take your hand, your yeah. Arm, yeah, you can print that. Well, with the printers that I've mentioned, I mean, well, you, with some modification, yes, you could. I mean, yeah, printing a tattoo is it's yeah, it's been it's done, and but it's, are you talking about like a, a tattoo out of living cells or just just tattoo period? That's the second part of the question. Oh, so so yes, you're asking that too. <laughs> yes. I mean. 
I wouldn't say it's completely out of the question, but uh, I don't, oh, I actually see reasons why you might want to. I mean, yeah, that's, 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 that's a possibility. All depends on how you go about it. But I, I like that question, thank you. Yes. Oh, yeah, there's actually some, uh, de there, like in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of really good research that's, that, that shows us like building that. And so um, I'm actually quite excited um, to, um, based on those particular papers. But uh, yeah, I'd say we're, I'd say in the next 20 years, I think we will be very much, uh, I think we'll be very happy as, if we, as, as long as we manage to avoid blowing each, each other up. But that's, that's as far as I'll say there. <laughs> Any additional questions? Oh, yes. Yeah, okay. We have a hard one for you. Go ahead. Hockey law in biosense of mm -hmm. material construction. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? How does that influence your research? Wait, say it one more time. Uh, how do, uh, what do you think about it? Mm -hmm. Personal opinion. How does it influence your research? About which exactly? Patent law related oh. to biosense of materials. <sighs> that, I'd say it was for, for my research and, uh, well, for my outgoing, uh, for my outgoing research for my lab, I mean, I can't say it really affects much because that's you know that's done and that's then and done. But going forward, for just the I guess average enthusiast or people looking to, or for people looking to um, to innovate, I I mean, if you're not a company, I think, oh, if you're not a large company, I'd say that would be troubling. Um, but if you're a large company, uh, gosh, that's that's something to be happy about. But I'm, you know, I, I am not a comp large company. Yes. So, build on that. So, are there uh, is there also a patent on biosensor that are given in your work? My work, oh, well, or like the work in general of your community. It's not that limit. Oh, well, I'd say, I'd say yes. There is work that has, in general, uh, you know, held back the community. Uh, if we look back to the earliest uh, 3D uh, printing tech, you know, there were a lot of, uh, I mean. There were a lot of uh, there were a lot of legal implements that held back a lot of innovation for a while, and and a lot of that is foundational to uh, you know to the more complex work. So I'd say that uh, yeah, there's I mean there's a, there's a, there's a lot legally which has been problematic for a research in, like overall yes, anything that's uh, holding back fundamental or f uh, foundational aspects of our like of, of our either our hardware, uh, our hardware development, or even or software development, can be an obstacle. Yes. I, I have a question about your research. Like certainly, uh, you said you print it in place in the matrix. Indeed, yes. Like a lot of uh, printers out in the research, they uh, you know they print the cells with the ECM, and often and in, in, in a lot of a lot of thirty printers, uh, well bio printers, there are they're. Basically, through their uh, method, it's hard to really calculate how many cells you've actually laid within, and that could be a problem. Uh, for our for our work, we uh, print the cells directly into the ECM, which is already prepared. Uh -huh. And so I'm curious, like the exit track, the exit track mm -hmm. from coming out of the ECM or whatever, and uh, like how does that limit the designs that you can do, or is it not a problem at all? Um, doesn't it's not really well for the for. How are so, so for how not going lab uh, does their work? That's yeah, that's that's not a problem. For some for people looking to yeah for for our lab, that's the way that the outgoing track is is not is not a problem currently. And for other labs and other uh, teams, it, it like it very may well, uh, well very it, it very well uh, could be. But I mean ultimately, I'd say I mean to be well. I can. I guess I can only answer that in the question. In, I can answer that question in the scope of my lab, because everybody's uh, everybody's project will require a different. Might require a different type of printer, and it might require a different uh, type of uh, modification to said printer. So it's yeah. I have to answer in the in our context, and I'd say it's not a problem. Did they? Did it, it came out and went back in for every de deposition, or does it drag? Oh no! It comes back out, okay. and then prints in another location. Comes out right. like that. And uh, yeah, the 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 uh, the, uh, 
the organoids are able to uh, to form uh, quite quickly and without uh, without a, without a, without problems. I would, um, oh yes. Um, I would say, uh, well, in the pur purpose of like a lot, in the purpose, I mean, the, um, in the uh, context of like our lab's work, we, you know, we print like per injection, um, we can print as uh, few as uh, one cell if we need to. And so, but usually for like my, for like my work, uh, we're printing, uh, you know, more than that per injection. Um, but easily I can, with the way that we, uh, the way that, with the way that we, uh, extrude cells with the way that we plan our prints, you can get a rough idea of exactly how many cells you are uh, placing in per, per print per well. Yes. That depend that it, that depends on a lot of uh, gosh that there are a lot of uh, fundamental um, there are a lot of fundamental um, understandings that need to be that need to be filled before we I guess before I can well there's a lot of work ahead um, in order to get one that's functional one that you would to get one that's uh, functional that you would feel comfortable replacing. I mean, I wouldn't, I mean, uh, one estimate that I've seen from one researcher was about 25 years, and from the research that I've seen, I more or less agree with that. And so, um, but again, this can, because of how, how, sci how unpredict unpredictably science may change in terms of when certain advancements are uh, found and how, that could be closer or farther. It's really hard to say. So like a lot of these like time these time estimates, these are just ballparks, and we're assuming that, we're assuming a certain rate, but we really don't know. Yes, indeed. Yeah, um, yeah. I would say that there are members. So, like, so my my academic experience is in infectious disease microbiology, and in the course of that work, like, I prepared three D skin models. So not through bioprinting, but just through like depositing cells on a, on an extracellular matrix and manipulating it in a way so that it would make a tissue structure. Um, so, I mean, there are various people that come through the doors that have some experience, but we're not organized formally to like distribute that experience to folks. The idea is that you come and you spend time with us, like you talk about your project and we hang out and we like say, oh yeah, that sounds fun, we should try to do that. That's like within our grasp. I think we're really looking for projects that are yeah, within our grasp, given the materials that we have. Um, in terms of like, specific, so like there's been a lot of focus talking about cell bioprinting here, like uh, mammalian cell bioprinting. So we have the facilities to do such a thing. Uh, we would probably ask people that not use human cells is like one of our, uh, the, like, uh, one of our biosafety practices. Um, but like there's also bioprinting, like you sort of touched on it, there was a yeast question and something was asked about the breadth of bioprinting. You can also bioprint with the extracellular matrix taken from bacteria. Um, and, and so like there are also, there are other structures that can be made those structures can be thought of as, uh, like, I think you, in, your, in your presentation you said microenvironments, right? Like different types of environments, different ways of like um, doing chemistry that requires the isolation of certain bacteria from each other so that they pass off reactions. Uh, so there's a lot of space to be explored. It might not be uh, necessarily tissue culture. Yeah. And, 
And you, you do mention it, it sounds challenging. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Danny. Um, oh, yeah, just a question? Oh, yes, you have a question? Indeed. Indeed. Uh, and, and those two, those will require like many rounds of testing before those will be, uh, well, they're currently, so many, uh, like many organs grown on pigs, those are uh, in testing, but yeah, it'll be a while before we, uh, before I guess we're, we're, uh, we're comfortable with those um, in us. It'll be a while. So I'd just, go ahead. So I was going to say, as far as like kind of hijacking and answering that question, Certainly. Asked, uh, we already implanted three restricted planets because they're so simple. But that's only because it is like a, you know, a uniform cell type. Mm -hmm. The next most likely candidate is probably going to be a kidney. But that's the internal structure that is the biggest problem. Indeed. That complexity is, yeah, there's a lot of work needed to just to get that just right. And I understand the, the, many of the reasons why a lot of people just want to, uh, you know, try to print, uh, you know, what we have and just place it in. But that would not be very, that would not be helpful, uh, you know, for the person. And nor would it really be that functional, I hate to say it. Uh, but also the, in terms of reliability and numbers, it's, yeah, it's not, uh, not it's, it's something worth taking our time with. Uh, so we can get it properly right. Oh, yes. Excellent. Thank you. Any additional questions? Any additional comments? Oh. All right. Thank you all.